Good evening, everybody. And for those of you who are in the room, let's please come on in and be finding a seat. We have a few announcements to make, and then I will introduce the speaker. But as we come in and sit down, let me extend a welcome to all of you, to those of you who are with us here in the building on the Charlotte campus, and also to those of you who are joining us now by the live stream. And I would like also to welcome those of you who are not connected yet, but who will be watching this on YouTube once the video is put up on YouTube in another week or so. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Charlotte campus of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. My name is Don Fairbairn. I'm the director of the Robert C. Cooley Study Center for the Study of Early Christianity. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this joyous occasion, this evening when we have to come together as your people to learn from your servant, Stephen Notley, to go deeper into your word, to seek to understand more fully your son, Jesus Christ, in light of his context, in light of the world in which he lived, the world of which he was a part. I ask that you would bless our time together this evening. I ask that you would open our minds to grow closer to you, to worship you, to have a greater appreciation for your word and your truth and your son. And we pray in his name. Amen. Let me make a few announcements first uh, before we get started. First announcement is that we have several of Dr. Notley's books and various other Gordon Conwell paraphernalia on sale, on sale right out here. So please do check out the books if you would like to look at one of those. One of the things that the Cooley Center does is to provide educational opportunities, such as these lectures, such as articles and news items that we place on our webpage, but also we provide educational opportunities through trips. And there are two trips that I would like to alert you to that will be coming up in the calendar year. Uh, the first of those is that this fall in September or October, we will be taking another trip to the Museum of the Bible. We did one this past July, which was a, a very enjoyable and successful trip. The great draw this time around is that the former director of the museum, Tony Zeiss, is going to be leading our trip to the Museum of the Bible. So Michelle will be giving you more information, and you will not want to miss this trip led by Tony Zeiss himself. And the second a big trip that I would like to announce is a Christmas and post-Christmas trip to Israel, December 26th, 2020 through January 9th, 2021. We will be taking a Cooley Center multi-generational trip to Israel, encouraging families, people from more than one generation in a family to be a part of that. So there will be more information about that trip coming from Michelle in the next few weeks and months as well. So do take note of those trips. Please, if you have the opportunity, join us for one or both of those. But now let's turn our attention to this evening. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our Cooley Lecture for January of 2020. That is Dr. Stephen Notley of Nyack College in New York City. And Dr. Notley is an old friend of Dr. Cooley's, has known him for a long time, one of many protégés of Dr. Cooley. And Dr. Notley, like his mentor, is a noted archaeologist. In fact, let me say that this is a great year for the Cooley Center and that both of our main lectures this year are directly related to biblical archaeology. Dr. Cooley himself gave our lecture in November, and now we'll hear from one of his protégés, Dr. Notley, today and tomorrow. Dr. Notley holds a PhD from Hebrew Union University in Jerusalem, and he has been at Nyack for, I believe he said, 18 years now, came to Nyack in 2001. And this evening, he's going to talk to us about a, an archaeological find that may lead us to rethink 
what site is the biblical Bethsaida. So this is this was always exciting when a new discovery, a new set of archaeological digs leads to a more accurate identification of one of the places where important events in the Bible took place. And that is the possibility before us. We look forward to having Dr. Notley speak about that this evening. Then tomorrow, he's going to talk about Jesus in light of his background in Judaism, also relying heavily on biblical theology. So we're glad you're here. We're delighted you're here this evening. We hope you'll come back and join us tomorrow as well. But let's welcome Dr. Stephen Knott. Get myself turned on here. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for coming. I know some of you have come from quite a distance to, to be here this evening for us to talk about an archaeological excavation that's going on um, in the northern parts of Israel. Um, there are a, a few people here. I, I always, you know, I'm up here talking and sort of, you know, the poster boy for the, the excavation, but actually what happens is, uh, is the people who actually are really in the squares digging. And I would, there are a number of them here this evening, and I would actually like to recognize them. Uh, if you've dug at El Arraj, could you please stand? Very good. All right, so they're the people who do the real work. Uh, I just stand up and talk about it. Um, no, it's, it's a real honor and a privilege to be here this evening. Um, before I start talking about the excavations and what has gone on and been in it, um, I've said this on a number of occasions privately, I need to say it publicly now, um, that this dig would not be going forward uh, without the input, wisdom, genius of Bob Cooley. Uh, Bob is the gray eminence. Uh, no emphasis on gray in terms of our hair, brother, but, uh, <laughs> but he is the gray eminence. If you know that expression, he's the wisdom behind this. Um, this dig has grown. Um, I'm an academic, and I'm, I'm not given to financial matters and how to fund such things. And so when this was dropped in my lap to try to find the funding for this, and it's grown every year, I had no clue. And a mutual friend of ours said, call Bob Cooley. And he has been extraordinarily generous with his time, his wisdom. Sometimes I felt like a student uh, because he would say, you know, you need to include this, this, and this in the proposal. So I said, well, let me do it and send it to you. And I would send it to you. And it was like a student marking up the paper. And he would say, no, you need to change this to this, turn this around. What are you putting breakfast at the top of the budget? You know, you don't put the breakfast at the top of the budget. Uh, although for the people excavating, that's the most important thing on the budget. Uh, but uh, Dr. Cooley has been an extraordinary, um, valuable help in, in moving this excavation along. And I can seriously say that we would not be continuing, would not have made it this far without his uh, contribution. So I want to say again, I've said it to you personally, I'm going to say it private, I mean publicly here. My deep, deep thanks, brother. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're here. The title is Finding the Lost City of the Gospels. Um, I approach this, first of all, I have to always tell people I'm, I'm not a formally trained archaeologist. I know how to swing a pick. I can work in a square. I understand some of the rubrics <laughs> to it, but... Uh, but that's not my training. My training is as a historian. I can read ancient literature. And because I was educated and lived for 16 years in Israel, um, and through, we'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow evening because it also spills into some of our subject tomorrow. Uh, but I found myself engaging um, physical realities of the story. Geography, history, uh, geography, archeology, span and I had the privilege to work alongside and get to know a man named Anson Rainey, who I think without any question was the foremost uh, biblical historical geographer in the world. And Anson sort of drew me in 
and got me involved in, in the field of historical geography, which is a multidisciplinary approach. It's, it's language, it's history, it's geography, it's archaeology, it's toponymy, the study of place names. All of those go into sort of the, trying to unpack and look at the relationship of our story and the contours of land. And uh, I'm sort of an oddity in the, in the field of historical geography. Almost all of the, my colleagues who work in historical geography work in the other part of the book, in uh, the Old Testament. I happen to be a New Testament uh, scholar. So I, I work in New Testament historical geography. And one of the subjects that very early on I became aware of is the problem of, of Bethsaida, which we're going to talk about this evening. Now, a lot of folks, when we talk about finding a lost city, they ask the question, how do you lose a city? Now, uh, I've, I know a number of you have been to Israel, and you get on a bus, and you go to a site, you get off, and there's a sign there in front of Capernaum, Caesarea, Bethlehem. You, you have these signs everywhere, and you, you get off, maybe even have your picture taken in front of the sign, assuming that you, uh, everyone's always known where these places are. And the reality is, is that until about 150 years ago, no one knew where most of these places were. The places you visit had been destroyed, abandoned, and forgotten. And we start a process in the middle of the 19th century of, of people traveling to the Holy Land. Travel became much easier, much more accessible. So people came out to the Holy Land, not just casual uh, travelers, although we do have Mark Twain and his story of coming to the Holy Land. Uh, innocence abroad, and then, uh, but we have formal scholars who came out by horseback and would travel the land and with the text in one hand and, and the contours of the land in the other. This is about 50 years before archaeology begins. So people aren't digging, they're having, to, and sometimes they were right, sometimes they were wrong. So, but again, most of our sites you can see up here on the screen Megiddo, Ekron, Capernaum, Chorazin. No one knew where those were 150 years ago. So what we're talking about this evening is not unusual. It just happens to be, and I refer to this and try not to sound too Hollywood-esque, but we're actually finding the last lost city of the Gospels. Okay? Uh, that's the task that we're about. Again, in the middle of the 19th century, a very prominent figure, this is how I'm going to go at it. So you have to... Uh, you have to tolerate me as a historian. I'm coming at the whole uh, approach to historical geography, which will bring us very quickly to archaeology. Uh, Edward Robinson, who taught in New York City, uh, was probably the father of historical geography. He came out by ho horseback, and he identified a lot of the sites that we know of today. And he suggested that um, that the site of Bethsaida mentioned in the Gospels, uh, the home of uh, Peter, Andrew, and Philip, uh, was at a site called Ettel. That's the picture on, that you see on the left. Uh, that was his proposal. Um, certain challenges to that, not everybody accepted his proposal. A man came along, uh, an American engineer, Gottlieb Schumacher, uh, and he did not think that Robinson was right because uh, for the very simple reason that Etel is about a mile and a half from the lake shore. That's a common sense thing uh, because the tradition, everything that we hear about Bethsaida, as we're going to see in the ancient witnesses, is that it's a fishing village. And that's, you know, to put it bluntly, that's a long way to pull your boat. Uh, you know, to have a fishing village a mile and a half from the lake shore. So Gottlieb Schumacher suggested another site. Uh, which is the one that's pictured here to the right. Uh, these are pictures of El Arage, which is where we've been excavating uh, for the last four seasons. So already in the 19th century, this debate was going on. This is nothing new, and it's been going on. Sometimes it, it damped down a little bit for a period of time, uh, but it's still sort of in the, if you read the scholarly literature, uh, this debate goes back and forth for about 150 years. And again, the, the problem is one of geography, the, the problem of being far from the lake shore. If you look, you can see the, the red line that I've drawn on there uh, is where the lake shore was. Uh, we've had some silting in the last 50 years or so since 1969, 
the Jordan got blocked up uh, from a winter storm. And since that time, it's uh, had difficulty finding its way to the Sea of Galilee. And so we've had a lot of silting. But the earlier uh, lake shore, the line of the lake shore is the red line that you see in the picture on your right. I don't know if that's vis it should be visible. And, the, uh, and you can see the difference between the distances of about a mile and a half, three kilometers between El Araj and Et Tel. So that's the first problem. And again, that's underscored by the fact that all of our witnesses, New Testament, Josephus, or other Jewish literature, all presents Bethsaida in the context of being on the lake. Again, in Mark's gospel, it says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before them to the other side to Bethsaida. Okay? Um, and Josephus, he talks about reinforcements coming from Tarakia, which is Magdala. It's the Greek name for Magdala, which has been newly excavated since 2009. And he writes, for when they heard that some armed men were sailed from Tarakia to Julius, and we're going to talk about this name Julius in a minute, which is another name for Bethsaida, they were afraid and retired. And finally, John's gospel speaks of Philip being from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, who were all fishermen. Okay, so there's a very, and if, if I went into rabbinic literature, it talks about the fishing, uh, fishing at Bethsaida. Uh, uh, so all of, the, all of the literature associates very closely the lake with the, um, the, the place of Bethsaida. The archaeologists who are digging the other site at Etel realized that they had a problem. So you can see the distance uh, from Etel to the lake. Um, and so what they suggested, the picture below isn't uh, from winter storms. Uh, this is a fictionalized uh, graphic. Uh, they actually suggested that the lake was considerably higher in the first century and that it actually came up to them, that they actually were on, they actually did have lakeshore property, uh, but that in time the lake had receded and gone down, and uh, that's why they're so far from the lake. Uh, but in the first century, they suggested that they're actually much closer, uh, right on the lake. The problem with that is the elevation, the amount that the lake has to come up, means that every known first century settlement around the lake is underwater. If you've been to Capernaum, you've been to Tiberias, you've been to Magdala, they're all underwater if the lake is that high. Um, they did not think through clearly the implications of trying to raise the lake to reach their site. So this is the first primary problem um, with the excavation that's gone on at Etel. Again, that's the other site. The second, and we won't spend a lot of time on uh, the other excavation, has been that they've excavated for over 30 years and they have minimal, almost nothing from the first century. They have magnificent Old Testament period remains when the site was prominent. If you go there today and you see a gate complex and everything there, they're wonderful. It's a wonderful site. I take all my groups there. Um, primarily, I take them because we can go sit there and look out over the Bethsaida Plain and talk about how do we identify sites? What are the questions we ask? So it's a nice classroom situation to compare them. I find it very instructive. I get beat up on Facebook when people find out that I actually take my groups there, I go, what's the problem? It's a wonderful Iron Age site, and it also opens the question for my students to ask those critical questions about how do we identify these sites. Um, but it still, it has a problem that the period of time when Bethsaida was reaching its zenith in size and prominence Josephus says it's transformed into a polis, a Roman city. It reaches, it, it reaches its climax. It is exactly the time when there's nothing there or very little there. Um, the first century remains that they have could be gathered in the front here. Almost nothing. And certainly not sufficient to, to uh, be the, what the remains of a Roman city, which is, again, how Josephus describes it. Josephus gives us a, um, I give a quote usually from Jody Magnus, University of North Carolina, uh, give her assessment of it. 
basically the same thing. While the Iron Age remains at Bethsaida at Tel, which is what she's speaking to, are monumental and impressive, the Roman period remains are very poor. And again, that's exactly what I was saying. We have great remains 600, 700 years before, but the period that we're looking for, there's virtually nothing there. And therefore, the site does not look like an urban center. And again, she's underscoring this need for a city. And that brings us to Josephus. Josephus gives us, um, in all of his writings, which are quite extensive, uh, he only mentions the name Bethsaida one time. Only one time. And he does, on this occasion, in order to talk about the name change. That is what Herod Philip, who's the son of Herod the Great, does there. And he, this is the one entry. And to the village, and I've underscored in red so you understand the language is very specific of what he's talking about. And to the village of Bethsaida, located next to the Lake of Gennesar, that would be his name for the Sea of Galilee, Herod Philip granted the dignity of a city. In other words, he transformed it into a city. He urbanized it by, and this, he tells us how he did it, by introducing a multitude of inhabitants. So he brings in people to, to populate the city and by other fortifications. And he called it Julius. In other words, he renames it the name of the daughter of the emperor. And we can have a discussion about which Julius this is. There's a scholarly discussion about that. But the important things for us to take from Josephus's first century witness, this is a person who walked the streets. He knew it firsthand. He had been there. And he gives us firsthand information and tells us it, it tra was transformed from a village to a city. And also its name was changed. Okay? So this is why every place else that you read, except for the New Testament, interestingly enough, um, it's called Julius. Because they're using the Hellenized name and not the Semitic name of Bethsaida. Okay? The, um, so we have Josephus talking about this grand city of Polis that Herod Philip developed, uh, builds on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. Again, I'm a historian, so I go in and I want to see where do we have other witnesses to it. We have a couple of witnesses um, in classical sources, um, Pliny the Elder, uh, and also in Claudius Ptolemy, who was a geographer in second century. They both make reference to Julius. We know that it's existing at that time. They don't really give us details about it, but we know that it's existing at that time. Then we get to Eusebius. We were talking about him today. I was talking with someone about him today. He wrote a very interesting work that was a, a list of biblical sites. And he's writing, this is before the Byzantine period, before Christianity becomes the imperial religion. Uh, this work probably comes from about 305. And he, he has this list of primarily Old Testament sites and sites from the gospel. And then he, with those entries, he describes uh, what's there. If there's ruins, if there's a community living there of Samaritans, of Jews, of Christians, he, he describes who's living there. And sometimes he quite literally says, you go down this highway, five miles, turn left, and, you know, and he'll, he will describe precisely where it is. If you're an archaeologist or a historical geographer, this is your starting point for identifying places. Because he's giving us, at the end of the Roman period, before the Byzantine period begins, he's giving us a witness as to how to locate these places. His entry about Bethsaida is very interesting. And it, it, it happens, it's not unique. There are other ones like it. But he tells us Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter and Philip, is located in the Galilee next to the Lake of Gennesar. What's interesting is that his entry is, is not any personal information. He gets the first part from John's Gospel, and he gets the second half from Josephus. There's nothing, you know, he's plagiarizing, something that you students should not do, but he's, he's taking, on other occasions, he actually tells us he knows Josephus and he's using them. We know his sources, but we can tell his wording. He borrows from other places. He gives us no personal information. Why is that important? 
because when Josephus doesn't give us personal information, he quotes something or he quotes a passage of scripture or something like that, doesn't tell us any details that he knows for himself. By and large, those places have disappeared. No one knows where they are. They've gone off the map. Um, that's important for our archaeology. You'll see it comes back when we start looking at the archaeology. Finally, the, um, the, the last witness that we have, we have another one in the 6th century, but I won't dwell on that one, uh, Theodosius. These are pilgrims, Christians who are coming out. This one's a very important one. It's by a bishop from Bavaria named Willibald, and he, he's giving his itinerary. Uh, and he talks about going around the lake. And again, if you've been to Israel, you've probably been to some of these places. He's making his way uh, clockwise around the lake. From Tiberias, they went around the sea to the village of Magdala, to the village of Capernaum, where the Lord raised the prince's daughter. And he gives us more information about that. And then he says, and from Capernaum, they went to Bethsaida, from which came Peter and Andrew. And there is now a church. He actually talks about a church being there where previously was their house. In other words, their church is built over their house. And they remained there one night, and the next morning went to Chorazin. And again, there's, we can have a discussion about this. They've confused, he's confused um, Chorazin with Kursi, which is the area of Ger, uh, the Gergesene demoniac, where our Lord healed the demoniacs and sent the devil into a herd of swine. And here was a church of Christians. And we know that that church is there. These, are, these historical... Um, witnesses, ancient historical witnesses, become very important in our archaeology. Again, people continue to visit the site. Uh, we have, in the end of the 19th century, Sir Lawrence Oliphant talking about El Araj and mentioning, um, mentioning art, artifacts, um, things that are left on the ground surface, uh, stones. You can see egg and dart. You can see heart-shaped columns. These are things that are indicative of uh, an ancient settlement there. We don't know exactly you know, what they belong to. They're just randomly uh, on the surface. So again, there continued to be interest in the site of El Araj, uh, but no one had ever excavated. For over 30 years, the other site at Tel had been excavated, in my opinion, with disappointing results. Uh, but still, that doesn't, you can, I actually wrote an article called Et Tel is not Bethsaida. Uh, that's one part of the argument, but you can't say just because Et Tel is not Bethsaida, that doesn't mean that El Araj is. You actually have to answer that question with archeology. span And so in the, <coughs> the summer of 2014, uh, an, a shovel survey was organized by a former student, a good friend of mine, Mark Turnage. Uh, he was able to, um, help us organize a uh, shovel survey, took the lead in that. And uh, we did a shovel survey, which is basically you take the five by five meter square, you dig down about a shovel's depth, and then you sift the, the dirt and bring out the, the <coughs> what's left, the ceramics, glass, coins, whatever might be there. And a good archeologist can go through the remains and they can, they can give a profile of that site. They can tell you who was there, who was living there at particular times. Uh, and you can, you know, without going to the expense and the effort of a full dig, you can at least get some ideas. This is a worthwhile effort. And so on the basis of that uh, survey, we determined that there was evidence of settlement there from the late Hellenistic period into the Roman period, the Byzantine period, then there's a gap, um, and then finally in the Crusader period. On the basis of that, we decided to excavate, and the excavation began in 2016. Um, the site, I refer to it as El Araj, which is the Arabic name. Uh, we, that's, that's, that's a part of uh, the story that someday I'll, I need to spend a little bit more time working on that name. Place names are very important and give us hints about things. I actually think El Araj hints to the name Bethsaida. It's a very, toponyms, place names are very weird things in Israel, weird and wonderful. They move, they have all kinds of very interesting aspects to them. My personal feeling is that the name El Araj actually hints to the name of Bethsaida. It doesn't sound like it to your ears, 
but I think there are, there are elements to it. In any event, um, the, the Hebrew name, Israelis know the site as Beit Habek. Beit Habek. Um, it's the site of a, a rich man from uh, Damascus, a Druze individual who lived there and had a villa uh, on, the, on the lake. And he owned all of the Bethsaida Plain and part of the Lower Golan. <clears throat> and he, um, we actually have a small book, which I was able to pick up while I was in Israel off of eBay. Uh, it's, I, there's the only one in the world I could find somebody reselling it. It's from some, some person in the northern part of Israel. So I told my wife, let's get in the car and go. Uh, mm-hmm. And went over and got it because it, it's the... Um, a man named Rudolf de Haas, who was a, a, a pastor, and he was, in 1929, he, he was uh, visiting Israel. He was in Tiberias and uh, visiting around the lake, and he wanted to go visit this villa that you see. Uh, we don't have very many pictures of this building on the lake um, at, at El Araj. And he wanted to go visit it, so he went by boat, and he... Uh, came there, the owner was gone, but the Arab workmen were digging a hole, doing some kind of repairs or something, and they dug down about two meters, and there they ran, they encountered a magnificent Roman mosaic. Uh, They didn't know what to do with it, so they covered it up. But we have this witness, this is how historians work, we pick out a little here, here, you never know where you're going to find your evidence. Um, And so, but we have a witness in 1929 of magnificent colored mosaics next to this building uh, at at Beit HaBek. And so uh, we decided to to do an excavation there under the leadership of uh, Moti Aviyam from Canaric College. Um, And again, you can see uh, this is the first century shoreline, which I've uh, drawn here. You can see the, the Jordan River is still serpentine trying to, this is not the course of the Jordan in the first century. Don't, none of this, everything be above the, the red line would be uh, water, would be lake in the first century. It was right on the shoreline there. Um, and I'll move on to the next part. Um, so we decided to excavate uh, next to the Beck's house. Beit Bek means the house of the Bek, uh, house of the governor. Uh, and so we decided to excavate next to that. Uh, Moti Aviam determined that we wanted to get up next to the house, hoping to find those mosaics and trying to determine were these mosaics Byzantine? Or perhaps we have a Roman villa of some. We, no one knew exactly the dating of these mosaics. So this is why the excavations, uh, you see the squares right up next to the Beck's house in what we call Area A. This is from the beginning of the excavations. We'll talk a little bit later about Area B, which uh, was excavations in 2018. Uh, We began to sort of venture out and dig away from the main excavation area. But again, the reason that we were excavating next to uh, the, the ruins of this house, I should mention that by the way, uh, the house that you saw in the picture is no longer there. Um, this area that we are is just beyond the 1967 border. It's on the lake shore, uh, but it's, it, was in, it was held in pre-67 uh, Syria. And troops were there, and they were using the house to do target practice on Israeli fishermen. And so Israeli, an Israeli unit decided to eliminate that uh, that situation, so they came in and uh, put explosives in the house and blew it up. So since 1955, it's been nothing but a pile of ruins uh, until we cleared them out, cleared those ruins out a couple years ago. Um, But the, uh, so we were excavating right up against that pile of ruins in the beginning and um, began slowly, slowly. Again, archeology span is a methodological, Excavation, you dig in five by five squares, for those who don't, are not familiar with that. And we begin our work in 2016. I've got a few slides here just for those who are not familiar with how a uh, dig goes forward. I know some of you are 
familiar, especially if you know Dr. Cooley. He's probably talked a lot about it, but for us, um, we're up at 4.30. We're on site at 6 o'clock. We excavate from 6 till noon in the morning. So we get to every morning, we get to watch the sunrise over the Golan Heights. Um, and again, we dig uh, and taking the dirt out from in the buckets and sifting, uh, sifting and, and finding those remains uh, that are from the ancient past, especially those uh, that are diagnostic, those that can have datable uh, possibilities. So they indicate either uh, the date, the, the level that you're excavating, sometimes even the purpose of it. Um, so we, we continue to, to work on that. Again, this where we finished our four seasons here. Um, then for us in the afternoon, uh, we stay, just so you know a little bit about ours, we stay at a place in, in Migdal, which is right across from Magdala. Uh, it's an Israeli community, but there's a, a Christian retreat center there. And it accommodates our 40, uh, our excavation team of about 40 individuals. And we, we sort of own the site for four weeks, that place for four weeks. And we, after we, we come and we soak the, soak the, the pottery remains and then uh, scrub them and then uh, go through the process of reading the pottery. Moti, who's pictured there uh, in the right-hand picture, Moti will go through and, and read the pottery and talk to the students about the dating of it and determining it's, you know, if there's inscriptions or anything on it. Uh, so we have, every day, we have uh, the washing of pottery and the reading of pottery. Um, and again, uh, this, I, I threw this picture in here because a couple, in the, in the fall, I was asked to speak to an elementary school. So how do you explain to elementary kids about how pottery works? So I threw this in here. You'll, you'll, you'll forgive me if it's, it's, it's too lowbrow. It's too, it's too, but, but I just, I think it's an ingenious picture and the kids got it. And hopefully for those who are not familiar with archeology, span you'll, you'll get it. The, um, uh, Coca-Cola containers, uh, look at how they've changed in time from, 1899 on up. And if we wanted to talk about cans, how is to you know, remember the days, some of you remember, you know, 20 years ago, you took a, a aluminum cans, you pulled the top off, and then you threw the, the thing away. And then we found out we were killing dolphins. And so they, they had to change that. So you no longer have the pull tabs off, but instead you pull them back and, and you push it back like, so the style changes. And the point is, is that, uh, archaeologists began to learn very early on. Uh, Flinders Petrie was the first person who sort of identified, at least in Israel, uh, the, the idea that at, in particular periods, there were different styles of vessels, of ceramic vessels, containers, things like that. Basically the same, uh, same concept. That if we find one at a certain level with a particular style, it helps us to date. Of course, coins are always the best ways of dating, but you don't, you don't always have coins. So ceramics and typology of ceramic uh, pottery helps us to, to date the levels. And, and this, so I leave this in here, even though you're not kids, but it, it's, uh, I, I find it very, you know, it helps to illustrate what we're about. Again, as you excavate, you, you dig, as you dig down, you go back in history. Uh, so we started with the Beck's house on top. Um, that, that, um, that Druze aristocrat, Syrian aristocrat, uh, who had his home there on the, on the Sea of Galilee. And as we began to excavate, we immediately encountered <coughs> in Area A uh, remains from the Crusader period. And what we came across was a Crusader sugar factory. Uh, these were vessels that were used for, uh, for production of sugar. And uh, again, in most instances, they were broken. And we sent them off. They were uh, restored, brought back to us. Uh, this is from last year, bringing the vessels back after they'd been restored uh, and the, uh, so that the team could see uh, the, the vessels that they had brought out of the ground. Um, so that was our first layer at the, Byzantine, at the uh, Crusader level. But what we found is the Crusaders did not do much building. They just used pre-existing structures that were already there. 
So although they're, they're, we have the Crusader period presence there, they're using uh, Byzantine walls. Uh, we have actually quite substantial Byzantine walls on the site. Um, and we, we were in the early stages of trying to identify uh, their purpose. They, uh, not only do we have the walls, but we, in the midst of it, we also uh, were finding uh, lots of uh, ceramics, pottery, and other things that indicated a Byzantine presence in the Byzantine period. Probably the most interesting, fascinating, and important thing is the, the part in the upper left. Uh, we found tessera, of course, are, are small blocks that are used for mosaic floor. Uh, those that you see right there are actually glass and gilded in gold. And they are not used for the floor. Uh, they are uniquely used uh, for a wall in a church, mosaic in a church. So this is the first indication that we began to have that we had the evidence of a church here. Um, the passage that I read to you earlier, Willibald, who is the bishop who came in the 8th century, talking about visiting Bethsaida and visiting a church there, scholars had, had dismissed that. They all said he was mistaken, he was confused. The church he was talking about is the church at Capernaum, the little eight-sided structure in Capernaum. And so when Moti and I began to talk about there being a church here, the church that's mentioned by Willibald, uh, the scholars wrote and said, uh, you guys are mistaken. You know, he, he, you know, he said, he actually told him, he said, Notley's leading you down the wrong track. Uh, this is not, a ch you know, there's no church there. Uh, Willie Ball was confused. He's talking about the church of Capernaum. And so Moti says, look, these are serious scholars. We got into this discussion. I said, these are serious scholars. I said, look, even serious scholars make mistakes. Uh, and I said, you more than any person in the world know that we have a church here because in your hand, you hold those little pieces, those glass tessera from the mosaic, the wall mosaic of the church. We have the physical evidence. Someday they're going to see what we're seeing and they'll have to change what's in the books. So we continue to go. Again, we were digging at the Byzantine level. Um, this is in 2017. Uh, again, we dug in 2016, 2017. We're encountering the Byzantine level and uh, then we, as we were digging down, we did two probes. Uh, and one is on the right, one's on the left. Uh, two probes to try to see, is there something below the Byzantine level? What we encountered, very interestingly, as we, as we dug down, there was a hard pack. And then suddenly, it was like coffee grounds, very loose. Uh, alluvial soil, basically what it was, was alluvial soil from uh, silting from the Jordan River, we found out later, but there was about a foot and a half of nothing, no archaeology, no archaeological pieces. Above it, everything was Byzantine. Then you have about a foot and a half of, of this silt with no archaeology in it, and then suddenly below it, we found Roman. Everything was Roman. Um, and so uh, remember, I'm going to ask you to remember what I'd said, that when Eusebius in 305, nothing was there. We have about a 200-year gap when nothing exists on this site. We, go, we have the Byzantine period, and then there's a, there's a uh, sort of a blank 200 years, and suddenly you're in the middle of the Roman period. Um, and again, we excavated on down. You can see the two shafts, the two probes. Um, when we came on down, uh, on the right-hand one, the, which was the western probe, uh, we encountered, we'll show it in a second, uh, the Roman bathhouse. Uh, on the eastern probe, which is the one that went down farther, uh, we actually found a coin from Nero. Uh, in the 60s. So here's another picture of, the, of this gap, this silted gap that exists uh, in the excavation. As I said, as we penetrate on down through, uh, we immediately encountered Roman-style uh, pottery, cooking pots, other things from, uh, from the Roman periods. So there's a dramatic shift. Uh, the most important thing is that we encountered mosaics. People were stunned when they saw the mosaics. Um, the uh, mosaics belong to a bathhouse. 
um, this, uh, it was a, there were two things that were uh, profound about finding the mosaics. First of all, is their depth. Uh, the, there's general assumptions regarding the depth of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, most people assumed uh, the Sea of Galilee was 209 uh, meters below sea level. It's always written as a negative uh, because the Sea of Galilee is below sea level. Um, and most people had assumed that it was 209 meters below sea level. Our, our um, excavation and our sort of um, the layer of the bathhouse was 211, two meters below what was supposed to be the level of the, level of the lake. In other words, we're, we're and of course, they don't have scuba gear. They don't have a dike. Uh, so everybody has been running to try to rethink the level of the lake in the first century and assumptions that were made regarding the lake because we're right on the lake shore. We're right there. So people have had to sort of go back and rethink in terms of the level of the lake. The other important issue, of course, is the mosaic itself. Uh, the mosaic belongs to a Roman bathhouse. At first, we thought maybe it was a mosaic from a synagogue like you have at Magdala. And we thought, oh, maybe we have a synagogue. But then other elements came into play. Um, there were uh, what's called tubuli, which are vents that belong to a, a Roman bath. Uh, also roof tiles that are there. Altogether, they suggest that what we're looking at is a, is a, uh, a Roman bathhouse on the shore of the lake in the first century. Again, as I mentioned, in the Eastern probe, uh, we, we didn't have the mosaic to, to um, curtail us, so we continue to go on down. And on the, on the Eastern probe is where we found the coin of Nero, 66. Um, so this is a, an important thing because coins help to date the level that you're. So we're in first century level uh, with a bathhouse. What was important about the bathhouse Remember what Josephus said about uh, Bethsaida? That Herod Philip transformed it into a city. That there, he urbanized it. There are certain elements. You don't have a Roman bath in a Jewish fishing village. It, those don't belong. It belongs to an urban center. And so this, this sort of, uh, this was the first evidence of urbanization in the entire region. Uh, it got lots of press. In 2017, we were on Today's show in USA Today. Suddenly, everybody's talking about National Geographic. Everyone's talking about it. Um, you have to realize that when we first started excavating, no one thought, they, they thought we were crazy, that this was ridiculous. And we already have a Bethsaida. We already know where it is. They've been excavating it for 30 years. Israeli government has already given its imprimatur. There's a sign there. Probably some of you have been there. Uh, and, you know, the, I remember one time I was talking to the archaeologist who excavates there, and I go, so what makes your site Bethsaida? He says, the prime minister says so. so it's okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I mean, who am I to argue with the prime minister? But the, the, so when we started, no one thought, they thought we were crazy. Most archaeologists, when they came and saw it, they said, how in the world? And they, they said, there, you had no evidence. And that's where historical geography kicked in. I said, no, there was evidence. There was historical record. And this, is, this has been the lovely thing about this excavation, is the, the working together between archaeology and history, historians and archaeologists. Because when archaeology is pulled out of the ground, you have to interpret it. There has to be a means to sort of interpret the significance of what you're doing. And this is, for me, this is where history comes into play. Uh, whether it's biblical history, whether we have biblical text or extra biblical text, uh, but they're informing us how we interpret what we're bringing out of the ground. So 2017 was a big year for us. It really, people suddenly went, well, maybe. And again, this was a train that had been going for 30 years. To actually stop that and to get people to take you seriously it was, it was a very difficult thing. Uh, one thing that happened that we didn't plan on was the lioness of El Araj. <clears throat> we're in, uh, in a bit of a remote site, and um, we're in the middle of a nature reserve. And so 
Uh, it's very remote, removed from any kind of uh, settled existence except for one squatter who's there. Um, but they, uh, people show up. And one time uh, in 2017, somebody came and started poking around in that pile of debris uh, that was from that house and actually uh, pulled this out. Uh, so it was, it's illegal. You're not allowed to dig without a license, without an archeologist. You're not allowed to do what these people did, uh, but they pulled it out. Fortunately, uh, it weighs about 1300 pounds. So they could not leave with it. Uh, but it was sitting there and about a week later, Mark Turnage, as it turns, was it your church? Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's from South Coast? Uh, Seacoast. Seacoast. So they were visiting there and, and lo and behold, there's this lion. And so, you know, they called Moti and they said, there's a basalt lion here. And so Moti comes and, and so they cart it up and, and take it. Uh, so this is, it's an interesting thing because it, uh, according to the Israeli archaeologists, uh, about 95% of the time that you have a lion like this, in context, it usually belongs, in the Golan Heights, uh, belongs to a synagogue. So we have some evidence of a synagogue somewhere. It doesn't necessarily mean it's on our site, uh, but this doubtless belonged to a synagogue at some point. Uh, so it's interesting because now we have evidence of a church, perhaps a synagogue, uh, only settlements on the lake, Capernaum and Kursi, which is the site of, uh, of Gergesa, the, the demoniac, are the only places that we actually have a church and a synagogue in the same city. And what makes them in common is that they're on the lake. And so I asked an Israeli uh, archeologist who works along with us, I said, what are the possibilities that we may have a church and a synagogue at, at our site? He says, very likely, you're right in the middle of both of those sites. So there's nothing, nothing to forbid it. So this was 2017. I'll quickly just give a few pictures from 2018. Again, 2017 gave us a bit of a boost. We increased the size of our excavation. Um, and the significant things in area A, which is the main excavation area, we began to expand it and, and uh, uncovered uh, a large Byzantine pavement. We're, we're finding more and more of a Byzantine complex, which eventually, uh, I'll just tell you, is a, a monastery complex surrounding the church. Uh, we, we didn't know where the church yet was. We, we had evidence of it, but we did, could not identify the walls or the location of the church. But the suggestion, Moti has done a lot of work with churches in the Galilee, and this is a very common feature, to have monasteries uh, attached to these churches. Uh, and so he said, this looks like this is what we have. We have a monastery complex surrounding the church. Uh, we continue to uncover elements from the uh, church. This is the base for the chancel screen. Chancel screen is in the front of the church where you separate the congregation from the altar. Uh, so we're finding uh, elements from the chancel screen. We also, I showed you a picture a little bit earlier of, a, of an excavation off to the side called Area B. Small little excavation, only, only dug during uh, 2018. Uh, we had to fill it up because the, the squatter who was there has cattle. And he was afraid that uh, we're, we're actually excavating right next to his front lawn. Uh, and he's got, he runs cattle out there, and he was afraid if we left the holes that his cattle would fall into the uh, holes of Area B. So unfortunately, Area B was excavated and then filled up. Uh, but from it, uh, in Area B, what was, we quickly discovered is that, remember how we started in Area A? We went through Crusader, Byzantine, Roman. In Area B, which is only about 50 yards away, and not quite as high, we're on a little bit of a mound, um, and almost immediately we're into Roman level. No crusader, minimal Byzantine, and it, it told us that as we went on out, we probably would immediately encounter, when I say Roman period, I'm talking about New Testament, including the New Testament period, So, um, the, which is the level that we're looking for, area that we're looking for. So you can see in this, a couple of the distinctive parts of this. In the upper right-hand corner, uh, you'll see a knife-paired, uh, the spout of a knife-paired um, <coughs> lamp. Uh, that is a distinctive lamp uh, made in Jerusalem prior to 70. Uh, 
Uh, they, uh, so it, it speaks to us of a Jewish presence there. It's one of the things that, that may hint at a Jewish presence. But together we have a different type of lamp, a discus lamp here in the bottom left. And we also are finding painted uh, plaster, fresco, red, uh, fre which is part of this urban setting. Again, we're not talking anymore maybe just of, of a Jewish village, but you're talking about something that's a little bit more ornate, developed, which fits Josephus' description of Herod Philip's transformation of this site. So point is, everything that we're finding, and we're not trying to, to match it, but the things that are coming out of the ground, they, they're what we would expect to find. Uh, if we're looking at a site that's a Jewish village, that is transformed into a Roman polis. Um, as we move into this season, one of the most significant things is we got, we got historic floods or rains last winter, uh, which everybody rejoices over, we get nervous about, because as you can see, the Jordan River is getting closer and closer to us. Uh, we get a little bit nervous because the water table comes up. That, um, that Roman bath, the mosaics, that Roman bath, the water table came up, and last summer it was all, it was all underwater. Uh, so it, it's, uh, we get a little bit concerned, and they're having historic rains this winter. So we don't know what we're going to encounter uh, when we get there this summer. Uh, but this is uh, in 2019, probably the, the two things are prominent in terms of our excavations. One is the, the more evidence, increased evidence of a Byzantine presence um, uh, marble and ornate stone that belonged to the church, including a uh, cross, uh, cross with a floral mo motif on it. Um, you can see the, the, clearly the Byzantine cross on a piece of ceramic. Uh, but what was really exciting is the mosaics. We finally began to identify the church. Uh, some of you may have seen, I don't know if, uh, seen <coughs> articles on it in the paper or, uh, I wrote an article in August in Christianity Today, and I tried to sort of give the sweep of the history of how this got started, what we're dealing with it. Uh, a lot of excitement because the, this church that was, uh, again, according to Christian tradition, is built over the house of Peter and Andrew. Uh, so we call it the Church of the Apostles. Um, I don't know if I should put this on YouTube, but someone asked me, someone contacted me recently, said, I've done... I've done research. I've looked everywhere. I cannot find reference to the Church of the Apostles in the ancient writings. I said, that's because it's a name we coined. And he goes, what? And I said, I said it's the Church of the Apostles. Church built over the Apostles' house. I said, it's very catchy, caught on, caught people's imagination. He says, you've invented a church name. And I said, it's, uh, it is a, uh, that's what it is. The Church built over the Apostles' house. But if you see reference to the Church of the Apostles. Don't try to look into the patristic sources or anything on it because you, you won't find it referred to it as that. Um, again, we, what we did, and I think it's exciting. So you have something to think about it. That this, is, this is the first time these floors, this church, has seen sunlight in 1,200 years. Okay? It's, uh, it's been buried for 1,200 years. Uh, we began to, we first encountered uh, the mosaic, you can see bichrome mosaic, uh, the black and white mosaic uh, floor. Uh, what we later identified that, that's the, um, the aisle. If you know the layout of a church, uh, the Byzantine structure, the basilica, so you have uh, two rows of columns. Outside of those is an aisle. Inside is the nave. Uh, we were excavating most of last season in the southern aisle. Uh, and you can see, again, geometric designs. But as we got towards the end, on the right-hand right -hand picture, you can see the black band. Uh, we slowly began to move, dig, and move into the beginning of the nave. Um, and we know that because we have column bases. We have the, the bases for the columns uh, that are still there. And the, the, and the colors suddenly can't tell it so much from these pictures, but suddenly they're multicolored. Much more ornate designs, uh, the braided designs, which you find very often in, in Byzantine churches. And so we're moving into the nave. 
uh, of that church, which is the central part of that church. Um, estimates are, multi estimates that the church, and you'll see a picture in a minute that sort of gives you a, conceptually an idea of it, uh, figures that it's about 20 meters wide. Sorry, I have to, 65 feet wide uh, and, and 30 meters long, which is about 100, 100 feet long. Uh, so that's a sizable church. Uh, and we expect to find uh, major portions of that mosaic still intact. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that the media loves. They love the color, they love the designs. So I'm hoping that uh, there's more attention uh, to what we're doing. Uh, and uncovering that mosaic in, the, in this next season, uh, where he would like to uncover most of it, it's just a huge task. Uh, those of you who have excavated, I, I did the math on it. It's 24 squares. That's, uh, we dug all last season in area A, and it, we dug eight squares. So he wants to do three times that this summer. I don't know how uh, we we're, need bigger shovels. We need bigger shovels, yes. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, but he, he wants to uncover the church as well as the inscription. Usually every church has an inscription. Uh, there are still doubters. There are people who doubted the church was there. Now they say this is not that church. Uh, <laughs> it's, I don't know what to do for them. It's, uh, we only have one church mentioned in the area. And we only have one church found in the area. I, I, I don't know exactly what to do, but the people are still saying, no, this is, not, this is not the one that's mentioned there. It's a mistake. So you need an inscription. And so hopefully the inscription is still intact. And we're not exactly certain how this church uh, was destroyed. We're not exactly certain yet whether it's, it doesn't seem to be earthquake. They, they haven't determined yet uh, how the church uh, met its end. Uh, but hopefully there's an, there are parts where those of us who are excavating, we were hoping for a little bit fuller mosaics in places, and there were pieces of it missing. So hopefully we'll, we'll see significant parts of it. So that's a major task in this coming season of 2020. Um, moving along quickly, um, and another fascinating thing that was, was found there, we have found scores and scores of lead weights. Uh, those of you who are fishermen, uh, and when you fished in the Sea of Galilee in the ancient world, you fished in nets that were like drag nets. And they weighted down the bottom of those with lead, uh, lead weights. And we, we find lots of them. You can see one here on the upper right-hand corner uh, of a lead weight. And the, um, what's interesting is we, a soft limestone block was brought out of the ground. It's a little bit hard to see, but it has like a, it has like a cross, uh, cross lines going. It's like a central line down the center of it. There's a depressed section with a line down the middle, sort of a cross section, almost, almost like tree branches going up. We thought it was some kind of religious thing. We're not exactly certain. We have a, uh, we have a guy who sort of comes in and out, uh, comes in and gives us his genius. He's very unorthodox in his... Um, Everybody wants him because he thinks out of the box. So he saw it and said, ah, this is a, this is a mold for lead weights. And so he actually went and built an identical one and, and made exactly that on the bottom right out of it. You put a block on top of it. You can see that the ins insert in the top, you pour lead into it, and the lines are like a brand. It's like someone who can say, this is my net because it's got my design on it, my brand on it. And uh, so he actually came to us and actually demonstrated it and, and did, the, the, did the melting of the lead, poured it into his facsimile, and, and was giving out these lead weights. And it's, it's ingenious. And he's exactly right. And so this is another indication that this is a site of fishing, which is one of the things that we want. Uh, we see, say Bethsaida, the name means the place of fishing. That's, that's its very name. So uh, again, we, scores and scores of these things are found. We also expanded out. Uh, one other uh, area this, this uh, last season, area C, you can see it's about 100 yards north of, I don't know if you can tell, it's 100 yards north of the main excavation site. Uh, 
uh, here on the inset down on the left. It's a small, it was a small excavation, but quite important. Um, and again, immediately they were in the Roman level. No Byzantine, no Crusader, uh, walls six and a half feet high, uh, two floors going down, uh, and with Roman uh, pottery, coins, uh, particularly the coins are important. Uh, I should mention that next month uh, there's an article coming out by Multi Aviam and myself uh, in Biblical Archaeology Review on our excavations, and this is the assessment in the, of the coins from Area C uh, that were found there, uh, according to Danny Sion, who's sort of the coin expert uh, up north. It says, of the coins found in Area C, 16 are from the first century CE, including two or three, which may be as early as the first century BC. There are two coins of Herod Philip. Um, 12 coins are from the second century CE, three from the third century CE, and one from the fourth century CE. So we have, again, we're finding coinage, we're finding pottery, uh, everything. And th this was a fairly small squares uh, there in area C. Uh, one other thing that we did this last uh, season, uh, we did a test case of, I, I don't know if I'm using the right language, uh, it's not my area, uh, it's, it's like GPR, but it's not, it's something different. They, they refer to it as electromagnetic magnetic imaging. Um, it's developed uh, to, to determine anomalies below the surface of the earth. Um, and they used it, we used it here in a test case of three acres and determined significant walls and a large structure. Uh, yet to be excavated. Uh, one of the things that we want to do this summer is to, this coming summer, is to scan. They use both, you can see the guy with his little thing here pushing his cart, uh, and then in the bottom left hand, they, they actually do it on the ground as well as a drone up in the air. Uh, they want to do a large area so we can determine uh, what we're looking at in terms of our uh, settlement size and also where it might, might be most fruitful to excavate. Um, so we're, uh, we're hopeful this summer. We have, a, as you can see, we have a lot on our plate in terms of determining this. Uh, we feel like that we're, um, we haven't found anything that has countered the idea, that has contradicted the idea that we're on the side of Bethsaida. Um, I love this project because I'm a historical geographer. I think that, that the, the, the holding together of text Language, archaeology is an important thing. And this, if Anson Rainey was alive today, uh, he would be absolutely thrilled with how this has unfolded. Uh, that this came first from a reading of texts that indicated certain things that have been followed up by archaeology and been proven by archaeology. Uh, and again, there's nothing that we've found that's, that's challenged or contradicted it. Uh, all we are lacking is more work, and we've only been digging for four seasons. First two seasons, uh, we were 20 people for two weeks. Many excavations are 100 plus for six weeks. Uh, we had, you know, as Bob will tell you, we had, you know, we, we had minimal budget and hardly any money to go from, uh, and, and, and only because of 2017 and finding of that mosaic of the bathhouse, suddenly we said, okay, we have to somehow find a way to expand. We went from 20, uh, 20 people in, in uh, two weeks to 40 people in four weeks, which is still not a whole lot. Uh, this last season, we were bringing in local Bedouin. Uh, most of the Israel Antiquities Authority's uh, excavations in Israel actually are carried out by Arab workers, paid labor. And so we, we brought in, I don't know, 12 to 15, to work with us this last summer, Bedouin from the Galilee, uh, who have expertise, they're not just, they, they actually know what they're doing, working alongside us, working with our volunteers as well, and expanding our excavation. We were gonna, we want to increase that, um, that manpower this, this, this next, uh, next summer. Um, again, the desire is to unearth the Church of the Apostles. They have to be very creative on this. This was the, the, the photographer's idea. The people here, are, are standing at the outline of what we think is the outline of the church. 
with the apps at the top. You see the people that sort of curve there. They're standing at the apps. And then you have th three people standing inside. Uh, the ones on the right actually are standing on the column bases. The ones on the left are the ones that we uh, assume we're going to find a column base there. But this gives you some idea of what we hope to do next summer. Again, our two goals are to unearth this church that's been uh, has been buried for 1,200 years, which Christian tradition ha holds that it's buried, uh, it's built over the, the house of Peter and Andrew, as well as expanding our excavation beyond Area A uh, to find further evidence uh, using electromagnetic imaging uh, to find further evidence uh, for first century Bethsaida. Um, again, this is uh, Moti Aviam to my in, to the right there, he's to my left, uh, and we're, we're continuing. Uh, nobody at our site sort of says that the argument is over. Uh, we think we have, uh, we're the leading candidate uh, there, uh, but we're, we're moving forward. What we'd like to do is this next, next year, next summer will be our fifth season. Uh, Moti and I have discussed it. Uh, we'll draw a line and say, this is phase one. Uh, we've spent five years on the question of identification, uh, and we'll write a preliminary report next winter <coughs> on the question of the identification of Bethsaida Julius. And then we will approach the IAA for another five years uh, for development and, and unearthing even more. So um, again, it's been, I didn't expect this. I'm a New Testament scholar. This is, I, I, I mean, I'll confess, I never had any desire to go out and do archaeology. It's, it's not my thing, but I realized that art, I mean, I probably shouldn't say that, but it's the truth. Uh, I'm a historian. And, you know, in the bantering back and forth between the archaeologists, they always say, oh, you're nothing but a historian. Yes, yes but you know, new archaeologists can't read either. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> so we go back and forth bantering against and with each other. They, uh, but it's, uh, this has been sort of a, a surprise. At this point in my career, we thrust into finding uh, this lost city of the Gospels. Uh, it's been a, an incredible, uh, enriching experience. I've uh, been able to, to work with fabulous people out there, in, you know, in the heat and the dirt. Uh, my, my wife and youngest daughter have joined me every season for the four, four years that we've been there. Uh, I'm getting more and more of my children. Last year, my son came for a week. Uh, this year, I'm hoping to get, a, you know, my middle daughter out there. You know, who knows before long, get my grandsons if we keep going. Uh, but it's, it's been a very rich experience for me. Uh, and, and watching the, using those tools that you're trained uh, in undergraduate, graduate school, and, and see those applied in sort of answering questions uh, and unearthing, what, unearthing which what I think is a very important site. It's a site that we have in connection with, uh, with Jesus's ministry. Um, you know, he's ministering there. He heals an individual there. He goes, uh, he goes there very often. And the outskirts of Bethsaida is the feeding of the 5,000 in the wilderness of Bethsaida, in the outskirts there. It's a very, very important place for Christian history, for Jewish history. Uh, and it's, it's been a wonderful opportunity to be there. So, um, you know, stay tuned. You, you'll see it show up in the papers, doubtless. Uh, this is something that people are fascinated about what we're doing. Uh, if you have an interest, uh, we do have spaces left. Uh, if you have interest of coming and digging, excavating, you don't need any prior skills, we'll, we'll uh, you know, put you in the square with Tara. She'll, she'll, she'll teach you how to, how to maneuver in the square. So, um, so that's... Our excavation, uh, I'm going to open it up to questions, which as a teacher is always my favorite time. Uh, this is when I stop talking about what I want to talk about, and we talk about what you want to talk about. So if there's questions that you have, challenges, queries, uh, feel free. Is this, how it's, is this how it should be done or not? Okay, let me take the mic to her. She has a question. Yes, ma'am. Where do you get your bunny? 
<laughs> you see a plant? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good question. I, as I started, a lot of people mistakenly assume, it's probably not good for the cameras, sorry. Um, mistakenly assume that we are funded by the Israel government or, or even our, our academic institutions, Nyack College or Canaric College. Uh, that's not true. Uh, this is a privately funded excavation. Um, individuals uh, believe in what we're doing, want to encourage us in what we're doing. Um, to be honest, the, I, you know, I told Bob I'd never, you know, I, the, 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 the budget this year is five times what it was three years ago. And, um, and it, it, you know, as a, we had phone conversations. I'm always telling them, I said, you're not going to insult me by telling me I'm doing something wrong because this isn't what I'm trained to do. I got a PhD in comparative religions, not in, not in finance. So um, we, the one thing I have is passion. I believe very much in what I'm doing. Um, I, believe, I, I believe, and I think it's being borne out that we're on the right site. I think in time and, and ability, but it's privately funded. Pe individuals who, who want to uh, assist, we set up a, uh, a nonprofit, 501c3. And so uh, uh, gifts are tax deductible. Um, the, you know, if, if, you know if, if somebody's interested, I'm always happy to talk with you uh, about that. Uh, this, I came here to speak about this, so I'm not, you know, I told Bob I'm not always very comfortable about asking. I'm still not comfortable asking for money. Uh, but I realize if I don't do it, then we don't go anywhere. Um, and, I'm, and I'm pretty much it. I'm the only one who does that. And so, um, but we're, we're privately funded. And um, we are, uh, you know, we, we've had a good winter, good in terms of fundraising. We're still short of what we need. Um, it's usually for me as a matter of prayer and it opened doors or avenues of possibilities. So um, I did bring some funding proposals with me when I uh, came, if there are individuals who think that that's something you might be interested in, but it is privately funded. We don't, um, uh, they're, they're all individuals. We have one foundation that gives uh, an amount, not a large amount, but a significant amount. But other than that, uh, it all comes through individual gifts. Um, so, yeah, very good question. Very important question. Thank you for presenting this today. It's amazing and gives me chills. Um, what, how do they protect a site like this from looters uh, when you're not there? Well, if you saw the picture of the lion, you know that there's an inherent problem here. Uh, again, we're we're out in a nature reserve, which on one hand is great, because that means it can't be developed, you know, they can't put up a Walmart there. Uh, not that I have anything against Walmart, but, uh, but it's, it's protected. So it's not going to be developed, it's not gonna be hotels there or anything of that nature. Um, but it, it is remote. Um, until recently, no one thought that there was any reason to have any security there. Um, for the most part, what we have, um, is no one would be interested in. I get, uh, as you can well imagine, especially after the Christianity Today article, I get emails from pastors, from Israeli guides who are being bugged by pastors. They want to go see this site. And so they, they ask me what there is to see. And I go, without someone who is actually digging, or better yet, you know, that there's excavation going on, there's really not much to see. There are holes in the ground. And we cover them over. Um, the mosaics to now are not, you know, we're getting to the edge of the nave where we're going to have color mosaics, perhaps figures, who knows what we're going to find. Um, so to present, there's no real danger, uh, but it's, it's a serious question going forward, how we're going to uh, protect the site, especially if we start unearthing magnificent mosaics, because if you know anything of the history of this, there are mosaics. They disappear and end up in people's bathrooms and uh, things like that. So it does happen. It is something that we talk about. 
Um, but it's, it, again, we're back to our question of funding. You know, it costs money to do that. Um, we're, w the other thing is that we, we dig right next to the house of someone who lives there usually. Uh, he's a squatter, but he, he has rights. Uh, he's from a famous Israeli unit, the 101, uh, who fought in the Sinai in 56 with Ariel Sharon. So they were given properties. These guys were given properties around the country as, as gifts. And this guy has been living there since the 70s. So we're sort of disrupting his retirement, uh, ex excavating right next to his manicured lawn with sprinklers going in the summertime. So, but Ehud has a role because he's actually there when we're not. He goes and stays with his daughters and granddaughters when he's, when, during, while we're digging. Uh, but, you know, so there is someone there, but, but not, not really in terms of a security thing. Others? Feel free to ask any question. I'll just yell that. Um, what prompted you to go to area, I have two questions. What prompted you to go to area C, first of all? And the second question, which is probably not a very smart question, but if you dig an area and you don't find a lot of things, what conclusion do you draw from that? Okay. So two questions. What made us excavate? <coughs> I'll just repeat the question for her. What made us excavate in area C? Um, uh, we, we wanted to dig away from the main excavation area because the archeologists on the other site claimed that what we had here was just a Roman camp. He claimed that the Roman bath and everything was uh, part of Agrippa's army, King Agrippa II, his army uh, was there. It, there are reasons that that's not true but still, you have to always counter these. So he suggested our little area was just an area of the Roman camp. So we went 100 yards away to demonstrate that there's settlement there, too. Uh, so that was the motivation to excavate at that far away. We actually wanted to excavate another place behind Ehud's house. Uh, and Ehud objected because it was too close to his house and was bothering him. So he said, dig elsewhere. This is the truth. It's just, you're, you're trying to be, you're trying to accommodate this gentleman who's living his, you know, his life there. So we said, and Moti asked him, okay, where else should, you know, we're not digging there, where else? And he says, well, there's a place over here that when the water rises and it's swampy, this is always dry over here. It doesn't, he says, so I would recommend that you excavate there. So the truth is, the person who lived there, who knows, intimately the lay of the land said excavate there and so that's why that particular site i'm giving you the motive why we excavated 100 yards away and specifically why that site is because uh ehud encouraged it um and and it was successful again um, there was <coughs> roman pottery coins on the surface and immediately there were walls you're immediately in the Roman level, Roman period level, again, when we say Roman level, we're, we're talking, that's the language we talk about. New Testament period is the Roman period, okay? Okay, there was a, uh, there was a second question. Yes, when you dig and you just find um, just a few items, do you draw any conclusions of why you don't find more? We haven't had that problem yet. <laughs> Everywhere we've, uh, the question was, when you dig in a place and there's nothing there, do you draw conclusions? Uh, you would conclude that nothing's there, that no one's settled there, but to, to, to date, every place we've excavated, we've found remains. And again, as we move away from area A, which is the highest place around, uh, we are immediately in Roman level. We, don't, we certainly don't have Crusader, and, and the site area, area C did not have any Byzantine it went immediately to the Roman level. There was one over here. Right here? Oh, okay. One of the things that fascinates me as I listen to your presentation and have heard other presentations regarding archaeology is how these sites change over time. In other words, you have to dig down to get to a, uh, a particular level. Um, and I think what I'm 
asking is if you can describe uh, at least a little bit for us the process of how these sites change over time in terms of uh, you know topography, geology, um, uh, is uh, is climate a factor in this? Uh, you know, changing of climate, things of that nature. How does you know how do these sites change over time? Uh, which you know, meaning that you have to dig down quite deep to get to certain levels? Uh, <coughs> I will answer with always the caveat in the beginning that I'm not a formally trained archeologist. Um, but the, the, the essence is that you, in antiquity, you didn't have what you have today. If you want to dig, you come in and bring in a bulldozer and you clear out and you start. Uh, from the beginning, they built on top of each other. So when you have a tell, which is, has slope sides with a flat top to it, it's the remains of layers of civilization. And if you come to some place like Megiddo, where you have 26, 27 layers of civilization uh, built one on top of the other. Uh, and so this is, because usually the site is settled for a reason. Security trade routes, communication lines, water, um, there, you know, access to water. There are usually things, there are usually reasons why a site is settled. And so that won't change. Those are human factors. So everybody will want to be there. <coughs> Everyone want to be at Megiddo to control access to the Megiddo Pass and the Jezreel Valley and that whole area. There are strategic reasons why you want to settle those sites. And so different peoples at different times, it won't really matter their identity necessarily. Uh, they still are motivated by the same human factors. So they'll you know, again and again and again will be there. So uh, in terms of the, of certainly weather, um, I mean, as I mentioned, ours, our site was uh, about a, a foot and a half of silt, uh, not from the lake, but from the Jordan, from the Jordan flooding. I mean, the, the geologists from, from Haifa University uh, have determined those. So there's a lot of different disciplines come into that. Um, so certainly, you know, weather is a factor, rain, uh, dust, those kinds of, you know, climate will impact uh, the settlement of a site and the, the development of a site. Uh, but, you know, I would say the primary factor in terms of like why it, you know, changes, it changes usually because you have one people building upon the remains of another. And it, it's, and so as you dig down, of course, you're, you're going to find earlier settlement <coughs> phases. Uh, and this is where, and that was my argument with, uh, in my article on, on uh, Ed Tell is not Bethsaida is that when you excavate, let's say a tell, and you're excavating the layers, and you know in the historical sources, whether it's the Bible or other extra biblical sources, there's certain activity there, maybe destruction. You know, the site was destroyed or it was settled in a particular period. If you're excavating and there isn't any correspondence, you don't find anything that matches what you read in that historical record, you have a couple of alternatives. First, you can say, well, they're all wrong, or it's wrong. But if you have multiple sources, independent mm -hmm. <coughs> historical sources, pointing to human activity, and there's no material evidence, you should at least pause and say, am I in the right site? And that was my point with Etel. We have multiple independent literary sources pointing to human activity that they haven't found in 30 years. So at a minimum, we should just pause and say, is this really the site? And so it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, I don't know if I've answered your question, not answered your question. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I was going to ask you one of the things I thought was really interesting about your presentation was go you going through the New Testament witnesses and some of the other historical witnesses. So 
what's fascinating to me is the intersection of your historic, like historiography and your New Testament work with the archaeology. And you kind of alluded to some other things in your presentation, some interesting intersections, like you kind of alluded to hermeneutics, you alluded to some other like scientific um, fields of study and how those intersect with archaeology. Um, and I actually think that makes the your methodology all the more interesting to listen to. So I'm curious, um, what do you feel like are some other interesting intersections, like in terms of fields of study with archaeology? Like, are there some surprising areas in the science world or even in like philosophy or some other areas of study that are intersecting with um, archaeology in a meaningful way? There's all kinds of all kinds of intersections with fields of science. Uh, and the geologists are doing things I have no idea of what they're, what they're up to, but they, they, the, there are all kinds of intersections and archeology span uses a variety of disciplines. Uh, we have a, have a woman on site every, uh, she's, uh, she deals in bones and she, amazing, amazing woman. She can see a bone and tell you immediately, not only what, animal it comes from, but what part of the animal it comes from. Uh, it's a little bit interesting. It's first, <laughs> the first, th first thing she does is taste the bone, which I'm sitting there going, my, my first thought is, uh, do you know how this thing died? You know, like maybe, maybe it's some disease or something, but, it, but she's, she's an amazing and a world expert. She comes every year and stays with us. And she, we bring her all the bones and she goes through them. And, but you can tell from the bones Let's just say this, if you find lots of pig bones, this is probably not a Jewish settlement, okay? So, I mean, little things like that, the bones can give you information. You can get a variety of information from various disciplines. And, and now we've got guys who are doing, you know, scanning. Uh, you, you, you have all these emerging technologies that archeologists are using. We're trying to utilize, again, they're not, they're not cheap, uh, these types of things. You venture out into this, it's an expensive, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's less expensive to do that than to dig two or three years and find out, oops, we're in the wrong place. Uh, so there's, there's a, for me, I, I limit myself. I'm an historian. I deal with issues of language, um, which acts as a very important thing. The issue of the toponymy of this place has not been controlled by anyone yet. Um, and it's a very important issue in site identification. Akaroni said it was one of the main things of identifying a site. Uh, was uh, the toponymy of the site, the, the name of the site, that oftentimes holds on, is preserved, and nobody has controlled this question. This, is, this will be my ASOR paper next fall, uh, and this is what I want to do is to sort of push that one. There are questions there that I need to answer uh, to deal with that. So there's a variety of disciplines that go in to site identification, which is what I, I always try to present this as an overall subject, how do we identify sites? And you're exactly right. We're gonna talk a little bit more tomorrow night, maybe if I can do an advertisement, uh, that the, one of the things that I encourage my students <coughs> to do, which I find, and I, not archeology span necessarily at all, but everyone, they get in their lane and they don't <laughs> listen to the other disciplines. There's nothing better than when the archeologists and the historians are arguing you know, they were butting up against each other and, and this multidisciplinary approach. And I, I try to tell my students, you know, the people who work in text, they stay in the library and they never get out in the land. And the people in the land sometimes don't read sensitively enough uh, the written text. So it's an important thing to sort of approach it from a multidisciplinary approach. And that will be tomorrow evening. One of the things I want to do is to go in and look at Jesus within this Jewish context from a sort of a multidisciplinary approach uh, to the subject of the Gospels. So, yeah. Have you found any forms of writing or inscriptions? No. Uh, yeah, it's a very, it's a very, very, uh, this isn't your question, but I'll answer the question that could be asked. It's a very rare occasion <coughs> when you find an inscription that names the site that you're on. I can think of a handful and have fingers left uh, in Israel. Just there's, there's very rare that you find an inscription that identifies the site. It usually comes through other means of, of evidence. So, yes. so you mentioned linguistic evidence in the brochure, and is that what you're talking about, the name here, Al Araj? Yes. What does that mean? Lame. Like, what's your 
Uh, it means the Kirbit uh, Elaraj means the place of the lame, and uh, I I I'll just I won't go into it because we'll be here till midnight. But it's uh, in the Byzantine period there gets to be confusion in the literature between two place names, Bethsaida and Bethesda. And Jerome actually he translates Eusebius as onomasticon. And where Eusebius speaks of Bethsaida, he calls it, um, oh, excuse me, where, uh, where Eusebius speaks of Bethesda, John 5, the pools of Bethesda, the healing of the lame man, the pool of Bethesda, uh, he calls it Bethsaida. And even if you, what's the new English translation? The N-E-T, is it N E? Huh? ESV, I think it is. If the ESV, if you look at John 5, and it has Bethesda, if you look at the footnote, it says, or Bethsaida. The reason they do that is that the Greek manuscripts are all over the place. In the Byzantine period, it gets confused between these two place names. And my, my feeling is, that you can't go on a feeling. Uh, it's something you have to actually scientifically demonstrate. But I think, um, and also you should mention that the, Jesus heals the man in, in the pool of Bethesda. In John 5, there's a long speech with no movement. And then John 6 opens up and says, and he crossed the Sea of Galilee. So if you're a Byzantine and you don't know anything about anything, you're going to read, oh, it must be up north on the Sea of Galilee. And I think that what happens is a confusion develops between those two place names. Uh, and that it, it gets ingrained in Christian tradition and it goes into Arabic when you hear about the, the place of the lame man. And it, it's a confusion. Don't, don't put historic. It's not that Jesus, it's, it doesn't happen up there. This is what happens in place names. A lot of times there's confusion that develops in this. So it's, uh, I think there's a, I think El Araj is a, is a witness an odd witness. Again, if you're not a historical geographer, it sounds very bizarre. Uh, but if you are a historical geographer, you go, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then when I present it to people, people who deal in historical geography go, oh, that's ingenious. That's great. The people who don't deal with this and don't deal with toponyms, with place names and how they move around and how they turn, they, they don't get it. But I, I honestly think that what we have here is El Araj is in a, in a weird way is a witness to the early uh, Christian identification that site is Bethsaida. Okay. There you have it. So I don't need to speak it at ASOR. I'll just tell them to refer to, to YouTube. Um, <laughs> quick question. Um, in uh, my last course, we were looking at the authorship of Peter, you know, first Peter, second Peter, and often used against the authorship of Peter as his, you know, origin of Bethsaida, if, and it's often depicted as like a Jewish fishing town, but in the archaeology that you're, you're seeing a very, ur like, urbanized, Hellenized city, does that make it more likely for Peter to have possibly had a higher education or something like that? I'm not there yet. It's a, it's a good question, because that's the kind of question you want to ask. Uh, I will tell you an unanswerable question. It's a very interesting question that I don't, I, I don't know the answer to. But why the the writers of the New Testament are not adverse to uh, other Hellenized names, Caesarea Philippi, Antipatris, uh, they're not they're not adverse to those. Tiberius. These are all Hellenized names. Why do they not call? Uh, the site of Bethsaida, Julius, because it, it probably is, that happens about 30, 31, something like that, about 30. So why don't, I, I don't know if they answer that question. Sometimes you don't, it's one of the first things you learn when you have a PhD is that you, there, there's still a whole world of questions you cannot answer. Uh, but it's, I, I, I don't know that. Um, but it's, uh, it certainly is developing if Peter comes from there. And, of course, there's a whole question of Peter being identified in John's Gospel with uh, Bethsaida and then in the Synoptic Gospels with Capernaum and, and reconciling all of that, those traditions. Uh, but the, 
if he came from a place that it was more refined, more Hellenized, uh, more, there, there's a strong rabbinic tradition there. It's, it's not a, most, this is one of the uh, fallacies sometimes of Christian assumption that Gal Galilee was a backwater, that everybody was ignorant. We'll address that tomorrow evening. Uh, but that, that's, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of Peter being educated, I, uh, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. okay, we want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and encourage you to come out tomorrow at 7 for our second lecture. Uh, got a quick announcement. <coughs> you have a question? I, I would like to have one comment. Okay. Oh, oh. How did we overlook you? Okay, go ahead. Well, Dr. Notley, uh, since you are now in transition from historical geography to archaeology, <laughs> your whole career is in ruins. <laughs> I, I heard there was a recent lecture with that title. <laughs> Jesus mentions Capernaum, Chorazim, and Bethsaida all in the same breath. Have you found any typological comparisons on the material with Capernaum or Corzine? Not yet. Not, um, other than we have, other than we have the same period. I mean, we have early Roman remains there. So, yes. In that sense, we do have uh, and we find we have we have Jewish we have Jewish uh, ceramics. We have uh, stoneware, which is if you know anything of some of the one of the markers for a Jewish uh, settlement is is uh, dishes vessels made out of stone because of issues of purity, questions of purity, ritual purity. And we have those there, which are a marker for a Jewish presence as well as distinctive, uh, which we would also have at Chorazin and, and Capernaum. Well, Chorazin tends to be a little bit, most of the excavation of Chorazin is later. Yes. It's not, you know, they always point up, up the hill and say, that's where the early Roman remains are. And they're, uh, so, but the, the Capernaum, of course, you do have Roman remains. Uh, well, the one, uh basalt fragment you had there uh, looked like a synagogue architrave across yes. the top. That's almost identical with the one at Chorazim. Ah. Yeah, and you have, and you do have a, um, uh, you, you do have some, some elements that look like they come from Chorazim. Uh, there are similarities in terms of uh, capitals uh, that, that look like they're coming very similar to the ones that you see at Corazin. So in that regard, yes. And, uh, yeah. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not, I don't speak ill of the archeologists. I just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you've been listening. It's a friendly banter and a constructive banter, I think, yeah. Uh, speaking of my career at Lines and Ruins, if you'd like to listen to that lecture, we actually have it on our website at the, the Cooley website. In fact, we have all of our previous lectures, but particularly Dr. Cooley's recent lecture. So I encourage you to go and check that out as well as a lot of other resources we have on the website as well. Now, real quickly, we have an announcement from Tony Zeiss that will be coming up, and then Dr. Laniak will come and have our closing break. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It was terrific, Steve. Um, if you haven't been to the Museum of the Bible, stay tuned, look at your emails. It, you don't want to miss it. It's really terrific. It's going to be great. Uh, we haven't picked a date yet sometime uh, probably this summer or early fall. Uh, second thing is, I want to give you an update. This is exciting. An update on the scholarship, the endowed scholarship. Some of you know about it. You've got emails about it uh, to honor our great friend, uh, Bob Cooley. And if you've been in colleges, you know, if you want to endow the scholarship so they only use the interest for the students, but, and it's there in perpetuity for students. And so that costs a minimum of $100,000. Sounds like a lot, 
but if we just took this room and you all gave 2000 a piece, we'd already be there. <laughs> but you wouldn't even need to do that because uh, we had a lot of people who've gone on trips with Bob who've already jumped up and, and, uh, and made gifts, so we're already one-third of the way there. So that's the reason, Bob, I want to share that with you today. Give, it, give everybody a round of applause for that. Uh, and it closes uh, uh, June the 1st, so be thinking prayerfully uh, about that. Bob, your friend Rink Jacoby uh, sent an email to Michelle, who sent it to me, and said, share this with the audience tonight. It'll take 30 seconds. He says, I bet you didn't know this about Bob Cooley. One, do you know that he's traveled to the Middle East 85 times in his life? Two, uh, do you know that 35 years ago, Dr. Robert Cooley suggested to the Board of Trustees of Gordon Cornwell that Charlotte would be an ideal venue for a seminary and that one of the largest donors immediately uh, disagreed with this vision. He later recanted. <laughs> I understand. Bob Cooley uh, was also uh, one of the instrumental people in developing the Museum of the Bible, as was Jim Moore. Where, where's Jim still here? Hey, right back here. Jim was in charge of the audit committee. I don't know who had the harder job, Bob, who had to have the vision for the museum, or Jim, who had to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, then, uh, let's see. Uh, and Bob Cooley has led more. Guess how many tours he's led to Israel? And, and, uh, and he and Eileen, most, most of them. Anybody want to guess? 50? 60? 84. Isn't that amazing? And Beth and I have been able to go on two of them. They were fantastic. And the most important thing you need to know about Bob Cooley, he has a new dog. <laughs> and his name is Rocky. You get a gold star. So anyway, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if, you, if you haven't gotten an e email that tells how you can contribute to this wonderful scholarship and uh, memorial, and Bob only agreed to do it because he said, it's not about me, it's about the students. So it's really about students. Think about that and how much impact they're going to, in their lifetime, they're going to have uh, for God's kingdom. Michelle, hold up your, your hand. Little John, she's fantastic. She can tell you how to get, you can go online, you can, you can send a check to her, whatever you want to do. Thank you. God bless. You. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the, the intersection of faith and knowledge, truth. We thank you for the last 150 years and to be at this point where there's so much for us to see on the ground and under the ground that just bears witness, um, often silent for so many centuries, witness to the facts of our faith. We thank you for the heritage of this school, for those who have put their hands to work, their minds to work, and to bring us to this point uh, in 2020, when all of us can um, just witness um, such a harvest that comes out of all these years. We pray that you take care of each person on their way home, and we also pray that you uh, bless our speaker and our uh, evening tomorrow night, in Jesus' name, amen. Got up there. Okay. For those of you that may not be back tomorrow night, we'll say a little bit more about a trip that's scheduled for December 26th to January 9th, an intergenerational interactive holiday trip to Jordan and Israel. If you have questions about that, you can ask Michelle Littlejohn.